Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to Living the Solution with Dr. Lena George. Today we have one of my favorite people on, somebody who I respect highly, a colleague who, like me, I believe, believes in medicine in the in the way it was intended to be practiced, using the Hippocratic Oath, patient-doctor relationship being sacrosanct, and it's about, you know, sharing energy and being able to be advocates for a patient. And before we started the show, I had a slight conversation with her about how I think everybody's being, is defining us as physicians. And I wanted to go back to the basis of what it means, what edu- medical education was and what it is now, because I think it's changed. So I wanted to welcome back one of my favorite people, Dr. Marilyn Singleton. She is a physician. She's also a lawyer. She went from s- Southern San Diego uh, to Stanford Medical School, where she graduated UCSF, and she spent two years of her surgery residency at UCSF then her anesthesia residency at Harvard Beth Israel Hospital. She completed her residency becoming an instructor, then assistant professor of anesthesiology and critical care medicine at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And she was the president of the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons. And this is somebody who's seen practice medicine, who's been on the academic side, who can actually speak to it from a, a legal perspective, which I don't, most of us can't. And I just really love the fact that you that you're able to spend time with me today, Marilyn, because we need to have a conversation about where we were, where we are now, and how we navigate this. It's very complex all of a sudden, isn't it? Well, thank you for having me on the show to begin with. And oh my goodness, it's such a huge topic. And I've been a doctor for many, many years and have seen these changes over the years. And I, I guess if you didn't see where it came from, and if anybody listening is old enough to remember good old Marcus Welby, they should look it up. He's probably in Wikipedia. And it was a TV show where he had his office next to his house and he had his his faithful receptionist slash nurse who helped him take care of the patients. And the patients always came first with Dr. Welby. And he knew everything about their lives. And that was sort of the the whole thing that the doctor saw you as a whole person. And then we fast forward through the years where one general practice started fading out. It's now called primary care, which there's a push to go back into primary care. But everybody went into specialties and there was nobody taking care of the whole patient anymore. And it seems like a mentality developed of medicine was just uh, looking at algorithms and how somebody said to do it. And not sitting down and thinking about it and talking to the patient. And like you said, it, it it's beyond bothersome. I don't even know the right word to describe how it makes me feel inside. It makes me feel a little empty for medicine. I would agree. And, you know, when I was training, I remember when one of the professors <coughs> in medical school said, and I don't know what your t- what your take on this is, but when medicine is going to change and it's going to be about fifty percent women, and when that happens, we're going to have a completely different uh, style of practice of medicine. And I've seen that happen. We used to be what was I, the three people in three women in ENT when I uh, when I was going through residency. Now it's probably fifty percent, and there's been a change in healthcare where it's become more of a team practice. It's not about the doctor, and I mean, I don't mean this in a bad way, but we were the the top of this of this group, and we helped put everybody in a position to help the patient. And it was very it was collegial, 
but there was roles that everybody played. That seems to be gone. Do you see from a, you know, and this is not a woman versus man perspective, but what's your take on that? Do you think that medicine, sorry, has changed based on the demographics of who's gone into it? It's interesting you bring that up because I was in medical school and in training in San Francisco during the Vietnam War. So I won't say the year, but go look it up. So long time ago. <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of guys who had served in Vietnam as corpsmen, and they became nurses when they came out. You can correlate that time to when nurses' salaries went up. So opposite to what you're talking about, and we'll get back to what you post, is when men go into a field, the pay went up. It suddenly it seemed to have more gravitas, which I found sort of interesting. And in San Francisco, we had a lot of male nurses. And in my medical school class, there were only 13 women, I believe, out of 134 students. So times have definitely changed. It's now 50-50. And people looked at it as, oh, well, when women go into medicine, they'll be more caring and, and pay more attention to the patient. And what you talked about is one aspect of it. And there seems to be this intersection of women in medicine with medicine becoming more robotic. And I don't think that's due to women. It, it might be because more women work part-time. There's a lot of factors that go in that, but I find it interesting that it seems to have gone the opposite way as far as that uh, caringness that was supposed to develop because women went in medicine. Now, all the books about men are from Mars and women are from Venus and all this kind of stuff this women like to be mediators and don't want conflict and and all that's very true and maybe that's one of the reasons this team effort could really take off i i remember w when i was on the trauma service and the, there's rotations through the icu and the icu rotations had their surgery resident a anesthesia resident and a medical resident. This was when I was surgery resident. And the medical resident was on her rotation. She had the first night on call and I was coming up next. And I said, well, how was it? And she said, well, a couple of patients died, but the nurses were nice to me. <laughs> and it was kind of funny because back then it was, it was competitive that um, the nurses tended not to like women doctors for whatever reason. I don't know. In one hospital, it was just competition for the guys. And it's like, ugh, who cared about <laughs> most of those guys anyway? But it, it was kind of odd where the nurses were looking for flaws. And that's a generalization. Obviously, they all weren't that way. But that's kind of how it felt as the lone woman doctor. So I'm glad to see that that's kind of gone away. But I think the team approach has gotten out of hand where now everybody's a doctor. And, and, and you wonder, well, gee, wouldn't it be nice to be a doctor without benefit of medical school or six, seven years of residency. And it's, it's, and so that becomes more of a status game. And who cares about the status in that situation? I want somebody with knowledge. I want a doctor to come in because I know that they received a very rigorous education in medical school and had a tough residency where they saw all sorts of patients, learned a lot of things. And that old saw about, well, 
There's no good learning experience after midnight, but we all know that's when the best learning experiences come. So, you know, when people are used to daytime learning and just a completely different way uh, of approaching patients, uh, everybody's not the same, but that does seem to be what's happened. And, you know, you can't shut me up on this because I think it all began when they started the word provider. That one, whenever I hear that word, all I can think about are these ads for people who come and clean up your house if you've had a sewage problem. And we're not service providers. We're physicians. And when we accepted, not all of us, many of us, when those insurance forms came in and it said signature of provider, you cross out provider and put physician. You can't buy into that. And it's an insurance term. It made it easy. So whoever it is that gave the service, but we need, patients need to know who's giving them their service so they can get that trust. I think you you said a mouthful in in that (laughs) patients need to take the, the, they need to take more power back. I mean, there's a law, I think it was passed in Georgia, for example, that people have to identify themselves when they're in the hospital. They just can't turn their badge around. They have to, patients have to know who's taking care of them. How did we get to the point that people are walking in and out of rooms and patients have no idea who they are, what they're supposed to be doing, and more importantly, what their training is? I mean, I'm seeing people in ICUs who may not be critical care trained, right? They're not anesthesiologists. They're almost technicians. I remember that was one of my favorite rotations because you had to think on your feet. You had to use all of your knowledge to take care of patients, and you had to have some guts because sometimes it was just you and the nursing staff in the middle of the night. That's not the same anymore. I mean, is it because it's become more corporatized that these, the the corporate structure things are all interchangeable. Anybody can put a code in, anybody can follow an algorithm. So therefore we're all in their minds, just a a cost center, (laughs) you know, a cost generator. (laughs) Well, there's a couple things when I think about ICU medicine and hospital-based. Okay, way back when, remember white coats? When doctors used to wear white coats and nurses used to wear caps and the cap, nurses were very proud of their cap because it indicated what school they went to. And then that stopped, and there's no question. They did a lot of studies, and I'm sure you know, as an ENT person, all, since all these germs fall out of your nose, um, <laughs> <laughs> that ties and uh, white coats had germs all over them. And so people started wearing scrubs, and everybody wore scrubs. And it was kind of funny at Beth Israel because people were worried about infection control in the operating room, which of course I'm sure they are at every hospital. They didn't like it when people left the OR in the scrubs and then went up to the floor to visit with patients and then come back down and they didn't change their scrubs. So they made the scrubs in the OR pink So they thought that would discourage the men from leaving the operating room. I don't know how well it worked. And at Cedars, people had scrubs, but the OR had blue scrubs, OB had white scrubs, the uh, cleaning staff wore brown scrubs. And so each area had their own color of scrubs and trying to delineate. But somehow it's kind of sad, you know, clothes don't make the person, but it sure looked nice when doctors wore nice clothes and then just put a white coat over it to visit with patients. And when when people started wearing scrubs, to me, that was the physical equivalent of provider. We all looked the same. How would a patient know? You could be the cleaning woman for all they knew. That's true. And it's even more to the point now because patients are just people are waltzing in and out of their patient rooms 
nonstop, really. I don't think it, you go to the hospital anymore to 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 rest because you're constantly being poked and prodded and open wa- awakened and having your ID checked and all sorts of stuff that goes on in the hospital now. But are the patients in a position where they can start pushing back and moving backward towards this a, a different standard of relationship? I mean, that casual relationship kind of pervades the whole doctor-patient relationship now. I mean, the disrespect on both sides is real. I think it is real. And I think the second part to just the superficiality of the clothes, but it does matter. Uh, We all know that um, how someone is dressed makes you think one way or the other about them, whether it's even just a cleanliness aspect or whether they're neat or their hair's combed or whatever, is all the mechanics now that are in medicine. It's like you talk about having multiple techs running around the ICU. When I first started in anesthesia, even though we put in um, lines to monitor directly arterial pressure, we did it ourselves and calibrated the machine. We had some nurse anesthetists. Sometimes they calibrated the machine. Now there's anesthesia anesthesia techs, anesthesia assistants, because the anesthesia machines are all computer, you know, not handwritten anesthesia records and all the extra monitors that are on patients and ultrasound monitors, you know, back in the day, you did a nerve block, you did it by feel. And I'm not saying this new stuff is bad. It's certainly good for patient safety. Now you do ultrasound guidance in order to see the tip of your needle. All these things are good things, but it means you have a person that has to manage the machine. (laughs) So I remember when laparoscopy came out that then there were, what were they called? Endotechs endoscopy techs. They managed all the equipment and they took it and cleaned it. And when all this fiber optic stuff came out, that had to be cleaned separately. You can't put that in an autoclave with it. So our advancements made extra people necessary. So I think we do have to make a specific effort to get back the old-fashioned, personalized parts, but obviously keep the advancements that have improved patient care. I I agree with you, absolutely. But we've become so high-tech that we can't think on our feet. And, you know, you and I are hands-on. Anesthesiologists have to use their hands, etc. What happens when you lose that skill set or you never learned it and the power goes out and you have to do things manually? Or you have to open a patient because endoscopically something happened and you have to know how to do a procedure <laughs> the old-fashioned way, not just through scopes. I mean, we've gone to such a, uh, the pendulum has swung to such a degree. You know, I'm all about tech. I am. But at some point, it, be, it should be an adjunct. It should be ancillary. You should know basics and you should have facility with it. Do you feel like the, I know we're going to take a break in a couple minutes, but do you think that the education of our medical students is highlighting that. I mean, they have uh, an iPad strapped to them practically. We used to have to memorize things. Do they even do that anymore? Uh, I don't know. And I wonder, I remember what I had in medical school, they called it your peripheral brain. And it was, it looked like a giant address book and where you kept all your notes and stuff. (laughs) I remember once I raced to the bathroom and it popped out of the pocket of my white coat. And there were some of my notes floating in the toilet. <laughs> I did retrieve them, <laughs> wash them off, and the ink didn't spread. But so I don't know. Maybe an iPad would be better. Although worse if you dropped it in the <laughs> toilet. Exactly, that's my point. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know how people learn in there. It's all virtual. I've heard stories, for example, of anatomy class. You don't have a cadaver. It's all virtual. Like you're using, you're doing it on a computer. How do you, how can you be a surgeon if you're not actually touching things and seeing the relationships? You know, it's, it's not all easy as it is, you know, 
when it's mapped on a on a screen for you and you know on an overlay you actually have to get your hands in you have to touch patients i mean i don't know marilyn but i mean <laughs> i've heard all sorts of stories about patients going to the doctor and not being examined I mean, no well, that to seems to be the the standard now. You know, How you do you examine people? Ask for exam. <laughs> well, and I think Medicare promoted that with their free, free, I say free wellness visit. And I remember the first year those came out, the wellness visit, the doctor couldn't touch the patient. Then it became another kind of visit, and patients came in thinking the wellness visit would be a checkup, like the vet does to a dog. The vet <laughs> listens to the dog's heart and lungs. But no, if you're a Medicare patient, you just have somebody sit and ask you, have you written your uh, final wishes? And then what are your drugs? Okay, bye. That's the end of the wellness visit. Who's overseeing this? This doesn't even sound like medicine. How did we jump from actual appropriate history taking, physical examination and coming up with a differential and a diagnosis to this? And let's take our, our first break because I want you to have time to answer that when you come back. So let's take our first break. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're speaking with Dr. Marilyn Singleton, and you can go to her website, MarilynSingletonMDJD.com, and she also has a podcast, and that runs on Mondays. Am I correct, Marilyn? Yes, that's right. And that's on America, um, America Out Loud, correct? Mm-hmm. AmericaOutloud.com <laughs> forward slash pulse. She has wonderful guests on who really talk, in, and doctors who talk about what it's really like to be on the front line, what patients need to know, how you navigate the system. And before the break, we were talking about the fact that medicine is no longer about physical, <laughs> physical touching somebody. I don't know if you heard this, but I heard the doctors are now using chat GPT or whatever it's called to be more empathetic with their patients. So they're not even talking to their patients anymore. They're using computer pro, some of us are using computer programs to simulate the doctor-patient relationship. What is that? What is going on? Well, it's so funny because I just read an article not long ago where they said patients had judged the chat GPT, which is AI, artificial intelligence, response as more empathetic than the doctor's response. So I don't, well, one, AI is only as good as whoever programmed it. And I wonder how AI can hear intonation and inflection. But what that said to me was not how great AI was, but how pathetic the doctors were <laughs> who were involved in the study. That's kind of a strong word, but it's the first one that came to mind. I, it's hard for me to imagine that the machine could come up with quote unquote better responses. Now, I don't know all the responses. It could be that the machine comes up with a response that validates the patient's feelings. So it has confirmation bias toward the patient. So of course the patient would like that better. But our job as a physician is to have empathy and compassion toward the patient. But we also have to tell the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. And if a patient considers that not being empathetic, you know, I mean, we all kind of feel that way. Who wants to be criticized? I mean, part of that is our communication skills. And I think the younger folks are, the worse their communication skills are. Not their fault. They've been raised on texting. Mm -hmm. Who are whatever they, you know, talking in these short sentences and emojis. I don't think that's good training for being a person that someone who's vulnerable or in pain or just having a bad time for a few moments. 
I think you need to have talked to a lot of people and realize how you sound. In my medical school class, we had a course called, what was it called? Communication something. And it was taught by a psychiatrist. And we were supposed to try to pick up some of the unconscious things we did that might turn patients off. I don't know if they have courses like that. But it takes a lot of self-examination where you do come to the point where you think you can talk to somebody, tell them news that they don't want to hear, tell them some flaws in their thinking about what's wrong with them without insulting them and still maintaining their trust. I think that's really important. And, you know, we've, we're we living in socially constrictive times <laughs> where everything's hyphenated. Now we have a hyphenated healthcare where you have, depending on the race and sex of your patient, you have to change your approach. I don't think that's necessary. What's your take on that? It seems to me that everybody wants the same thing, to be treated with respect and dignity and to be communicated with. It doesn't matter what color or what what you do outside of that office. Everybody should be cared for the same way. I don't think we need to have all of these sensitivity courses and all that if we're just able to really honestly be empathetic and and communicate what's your take on that well i definitely agree i find it interesting that there's this push now where they say well black patients do better with black doctors and well number one there wouldn't be enough black doctors exactly so and then what they don't ever say the corollary do white patients do better with white doctors. Someone would be appalled if a white patient came in and said, well, hmm, I'd like to see a white doctor. And guess what? Most patients aren't even thinking along those lines. As a fellow woman in Mm -hmm. medicine, I'd say there's more prejudice against having a woman doctor. Again, not now since there's so many, so there's not really much of a choice. In urology clinic, I had a few men kind of look a little cross-eyed when they had a woman coming in. No, you got me today. But um, racial, this whole dividing people by race and pronouns and all that stuff. And you don't have to be raised the same way as the person you're taking care of. I taking care of tattooed motorcycle gang members. I'm not in a tattooed motorcycle gang, but you can certainly talk to them. And, and, and I think that's where honesty comes in, where you say, you know, I've never treated a Hell's Angels before. This is exciting. And if there's some terminology I don't know, just let me know. And just be honest. And somewhere, the idea of being able to admit you don't know something has gotten lost in the shuffle, which I think is very important. And it's really important in specialties where there's no one looking over your shoulder. So you have to be honest with yourself that you're doing the right thing. You've researched something before you talk to the patient and be able to tell the patient, I don't know, but I can find out. Now, isn't that, that is the statement of the century. Instead of poo-pooing a patient and and dismissing them, I think they hate that more. I don't care what color they are. If someone walks in and they are asking your opinion, they've done some research and they may know more than you. And how hard is it to say, well, I'm not sure, but I'll find out, as opposed to making them feel small and Mm -hmm. demeaning them. And maybe that's part of, where we need, that's the jumping off point, that if we can pull ourselves back from that, that we could revisit our doctor-patient relationship. You know, before the break, we were talking about how impersonal it is and how it's kind of algorithm-driven and all that sort of thing. But perhaps hubris and ego need to be taken out of it and become a partner with your patient. They can know more than you do. They do do their research. Hopefully most of them do. But doctors, is it our personality, you think? Or is it the way we're being trained that 
because they're not fault, they have a question about the algorithm, about your sta- your quote standard of care. Instead of you being with them, you you have to turn against them in some way. Is that something that you're seeing that could be inherent in how the healthcare system is moved, where it's more corporatized, more algorithm driven, very rigid? There's no art to medicine in that system. I think, well, <clears throat> excuse me, that it it is a couple of things. I think this corporatization of medicine is harmful. And if that's what you've been raised in and don't see any other way or have been told, oh, you don't want private practice, oh, it's too much trouble or whatever, um, where you can become sort of robotic, I think one's initial personality does have a lot to do with it. And I think that's what makes medicine hard. You want somebody who's tough and firm. Uh, (laughs) We all know that the people pick specialties. Sometimes specialties pick them. Like somebody who doesn't like to talk to people. Many people like that go into pathology because They get to work with a microscope or dead bodies, and which is great because they're not foisted on living people who want to talk. Uh, People who go in psychiatry uh, like to intellectualize things and think a lot. And then there's fast acting people uh, who like to do things Johnny on the spot. But with all of it, you need people who can be firm in a decision. And depending on the specialty, that decision might have to be made within 30 seconds, and I'm not exaggerating, to come to the correct outcome for the patient. And so sometimes you have to be blunt or perhaps rude. Not often. I remember in my residency, the hippies were having babies at home and this was without midwives or anything. And I had uh, a patient who'd come from some hippie commune and she was rapidly bleeding. And, and she said, no IVs, we're against IVs. And I just had to say, do you want your baby to die? She was bleeding to death. We had to put an IV in and transfuse her. And she just kind of stopped in her tracks and said, no, you know, in goes the IV and we saved the baby. But those situations are rare. And most of the time, you've got the time to have a discussion with the patient and ask them, where did the information come from? Was it from cousin Nellie, who, and people tend to exaggerate what happened to them or how bad their knee replacement was or whatever. And, um, and then they say, Oh no, I read it on the Mayo clinic website. Sometimes now that people have computers in the office, you can actually go to the website together or if they've printed it out, say, Oh yes, this is the most common, but you have to remember every patient is different and you're kind of on that other end of the spectrum. And then go on from there if you kind of disagree with whatever the Mayo Clinic thing said in WebMD, because all of those things, they're talking about the average. And many times you get a patient who's not average and they have to know that they aren't. And that's why you've come up with another treatment option. But that whole, re- that whole scenario that you just described is the essence of healthcare because you've had a conversation, you explained why you want to offer a particular treatment or why you don't. I don't think those conversations really go on so much anymore. And during COVID, that whole movement towards virtual care and telemedicine, which it was just, I'm sorry, I'm not a fan of telehealth. I mean, if you've seen the patient and you know them and they're having a follow-up, I totally get that. But when it comes down to the first visit, you can't examine them. How are you looking in some for ENT, right? How are you looking in someone's <laughs> mouth, someone's ear? 
how you're listening to their, I mean, I guess you could listen to their heartbeat if you have a, you know, they have an app on their phone, but it's not the same. I and mean, they made it seem as if it's completely equal that you should prefer that, that it's, it is the, the standard of care without questions. And everybody just went along with it and they continue to do so. And there's whole movements, or I should say companies that offer telemedicine, have roped in X number of doctors, and it just becomes a prescription mill. <laughs> you know, you have a cough, you're getting X number of things right off the bat. And don't even talk about the doc in the boxes in the, uh, the pharmacies. That seems to me a conflict of interest. You're going in there, you're getting a prescription, you get it filled at the same place. No questions asked. <laughs> but for us with Stark, if you self-referred because you had, you know, a you know, urologist with a CT in your location, that was the worst thing ever. So it seems to be a double standard, isn't it? Well, it is. One of the, the things about telemedicine, it certainly is convenient. And for people out in the country, it's better than no doctor at all. There's nothing like interviewing a patient, though, face-to-face -face and putting a hand on their arm, assuming, and again, you have to kind of see somebody to see if that's acceptable to them, can do so much more than giving a whole list of, well, this could be this, this could be that, this could be this, and it... There's so many stories I can think of of people who've talked about their medical history and then you try to prod them to when it happened. And then, oh, it started after my husband died. And then it's like this aha moment. And then you can work back from there. Mm -hmm. But when you brought up the corporations and private equity and all this buying these practices, there's where the rub lies that these doctors working for the big groups are on a schedule. They're a hamster in that wheel. And patients are lucky if they get seven to 10 minutes. And in seven to 10 minutes, you can't get to the point where you figure it out that the back pain got worse after the husband died. It, you need time. You just plain old fashioned need time. I think you're right. And again, like you described before, it's not one size fits all. So it's not a cookbook and it can't be. And I wonder how many people fall through the cracks because they're, they don't connect and they get frustrated and they turn off and what could be a help to them, or, you know, you could fix the problem, it becomes something catastrophic, because they just get completely frustrated with the healthcare system. Well, there's actually a couple of movies out. Netflix has done a movie, and it hasn't come out yet, it's supposed to come out soon, about a girl whose mother was accused of having Munchausen by proxy. That's where Munchausen is where you pretend to be sick because you want attention. And Munchausen by proxy is where the parent or guardian um, makes the child sick. So the parent can get the attention via the child. And they accuse the mother of that. But the daughter had... Um, I think it was complex regional pain syndrome, which is a hard syndrome to diagnose unless you're looking for it. But the mother was punished. The daughter was being punished by being taken away from the mother. It's, it's an interesting story. I can't wait till it comes on. And there was another one about a woman who had seizures and headaches and and I don't remember what her ultimate diagnosis was. I haven't seen that movie. I just saw that it's out there. And it's, I think, a year old. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's playing on Netflix. And it's about people with unusual things, difficult to diagnose, 
that's when real medicine comes in. But if you have been sh shuttled from doctor to doctor who doesn't take the time with you, how are things like that ever going to get diagnosed? They're not. I think those are that's a whole class of patient who the system fails. I mean, I get to see some of them in my office and they're, they come in angry, most of them, because they figure you're going to do the same thing or not listen to them. And there's this wall that you have to break through in order to start the healing process. I mean, to me, it seems like the healthcare system is moved to the common, the lowest common denominator. If you have a viral infection, a head cold, it's great. But anything else that's more complicated or that takes the ability to look, see the whole person or know what the, base, the basic, basics are for physiology, those people are lost. And well, you and I are, I think, of the mindset that corporatized medicine versus private medicine are two different standards of care. And I don't think now it's our job to educate patients. And I have patients who come in and say, you know, I, I've come to see you because you're, you're a black doctor, which, you know, I try to educate them. It's not that I'm that I, what I look like. It's the fact that I'm in private practice and I can spend the time with you. And that's who you should be looking for. It doesn't matter what color they are. It's whether they are own their own practice and they're independent versus if they're part of a system. Do you think that's a really good first step towards getting to into the system where it's old school versus what we're dealing with now? Oh, absolutely. I think people need to be shown that, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got these allergies, um, I need an ENT doctor. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> um, that patients have to be shown because let's face it. I, I remember in grand rounds when I was a surgery resident, the chief at the time, Dr. Dunphy used to cringe when people would present a case and say, this patient was referred from an outside hospital and he'd stop them and say, what is the hospital outside? Is it in a tent? And it would kind of throw the the resident off. And he said, just because it's, you can say community hospital, but outside hospital was sort of a pejorative term. And they came to the big mecca, the big medical center. And that's part of the aura that when you go to a big place or a big system, it's got better doctors. And as Dr. Dunphy said, he said, the person who's at the community hospital is the same person who just, who graduated from this residency at UCSF. So they have the same education. They're just practicing in the community. So, but people have this idea that people who are outside the system must not be as smart or whatever. And Patients have to realize, gee, it's like going to a boutique store that a boutique store for dresses is going to have just as nice stuff, if, if not nicer than the stuff at Nordstrom's. And you'll get personal service. They won't be 50 clothes like that, the same ones on the rack. And so you have to change that mindset that just because a practice is small or a person is in practice by themselves, it doesn't mean they're some sort of medical reject. In fact, it means that they're very strong because they went out and started their own practice, that they're able to talk to a lot of people because when you're in solo practice, you use the phone a lot and you call your colleagues and say, I haven't seen this before. Uh, have you seen this? And you chat with your colleagues off the cuff. And then it helps you work with that individual patient. And again, you're not in the system where, oh, I haven't seen it. End of visit. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Who can we send you off to now? It, it's just, it's not right. No, it's not. And, you know, let's take our, our last break, because I want to discuss how that, from a fiduciary's perspective, why this came to pass. So let's take our last break. You're living in the solution. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome back to Living Solution. We're speaking with Dr. Marilyn Singleton. And again, you can go to her website, MarilynSingletonMDJD.com. Now, you know, I don't think this, we had, before the break, we're talking about how, from a fiduciary standpoint, whoever has the pocketbook, in my opinion, has the power. And somehow it left the doctor-patient room, went to the insurance companies, and now it's in pharmacy benefit management companies, the hospital system, the pharmacies themselves with all these uh, you know, silos where you have the preferred places you can go. But, but ultimately, it's about, it became about money at some point, didn't it? I mean, before it was about patient care. You got paid for what you did and there was nobody, no filter, nobody deciding your value. It's what you put out there and what the patient thought was valuable enough to pay. Now you have all these middlemen who are, have inserted themselves and are taking pieces of this economic pie, but they don't provide a service. That's how I feel about it. What's your take on that? I think you're right. It, I feel like this sort of uh, downhill flow of medicine started with the more third parties we got involved, the worse it got and the less choice a patient has. And that's another thing. I think patients think that they might have less choice if they go to a solo practitioner or someone who's outside the system because they've kind of been trained to think, gee, if you're in one of these big health systems, they've got every kind of doctor under the sun. And if one doctor doesn't know, the next one will, blah, blah, blah. But they don't realize that their choice is limited. And these networks that have fewer and fewer choices, the drugs you can get, the medications, are set to a formulary. The pharmacy benefit managers, who are the middlemen between you and the drugs, help get involved because they buy, make these contracts with the pharmacies and they get a rebate back because of the contract they make. Well, the rebate is a percentage of the contract. So sometimes they contract for the most expensive drug, then they get a higher rebate. And it's all contorted and people don't know the terms of these contracts. Wouldn't it be nice to just go to the doctor, he or she decides you need a certain drug, you get a prescription for it, you go to whatever pharmacy you want to go to, you can get on the phone, call a couple of pharmacies, ask them how much it costs, and then you go to that one. Wouldn't that be nice? Mm-hmm. It would be. I mean, there would be some uh, competition, right? There's no competition. It's one side or one choice. They can jack the price as much as they want. And to me, that seems just, it's not seemly to have an organization tell you that they're providing a discount when in actuality they jack the price in order to get the the difference in the cost as profit to themselves. So this system that you just described is not about cost saving at all. It seems to me that you're we're highlighting the most expensive aspects of our healthcare system, we're rewarding them. It's never going to change. And then we have the insurance model where it's so high, you think you need insurance in order to pay for it. It's like a self-fulfilling uh, engine. You know, they just keep driving the prices higher. You need help to pay it. But then when you ask for help, they deny you because it's not pre-certified or it's not medically necessary. It's a total scam, isn't it? Well, it, it is. And it reminds me of college tuition. College tuition used to be affordable. Once you could get at will these student loans the colleges started raising the tuition because they knew it would get paid for. And now with this nonsense of forgiving the loans, my goodness, what do you think is going to happen to the tuition? It'll just go up and up and up. And insurance it started off being something quite useful, just like car insurance or home insurance, where if your house burned down, you'd have it insured. But your house doesn't burn down every day. And your car doesn't get in an accident every day. So there was a big insurance pool for these unforeseen events. And that's how health insurance used to be. People didn't have insurance to go to the doctor. That you had insurance to help pay for hospital bills. And of course, now 
no one could afford to pay for a hospital bill unless you're one of these multi-billionaires. Because again, all the charges at hospital get higher and higher and higher because they know insurance will pay for it. And I think that's a ship that's already sailed and um, going to a regular hospital, you're not going to get a price that's affordable. If you need surgery, there there's starting to be more freestanding surgery centers like the Surgery Center of Oklahoma that has cash prices. And these cash prices can overall end up being less than what you would have paid in your, what are they now, $2,500 a month insurance yeah. premiums. That you so, can't even use. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, and that's the thing, you pay all these premiums, and then when it comes time to use it, you find out that, oh, well, it doesn't cover that, or you can't have that surgery for four months because of the pre-authorization and and now all policies aren't bad, but there's kind of a, a bad principle behind it when it comes to medical care. The medical care is about a doctor-patient relationship. And yes, a doctor is going to have to get paid. They're taking their time and doing a service. And there's going to be materials that are used and Yes, you have to pay for drugs. I don't think anybody expects it to be free, but prices should be reasonable and they can be reasonable. In offices that don't take insurance at all, they have lower prices because they don't have to hire somebody to do the insurance forms. So that's a whole salary that the doctor doesn't have to pay. So there's lower overhead. So there's a lot of business reasons that a doctor can be in solo practice, cash-based practice, and the patient benefits. And when you chit up all the, the numbers, the patient actually comes out ahead financially, <laughs> as well as medically. I agree. There's so much opacity. I mean, I think, wasn't there a law there's supposed to be transparency in what these hospitals charge? I don't think it was ever implemented. <laughs> well. I mean, it would be nice to know that if you went for a procedure in a private doctor's office versus going for the same procedure in a hospital-based practice and seeing the facility fees, et cetera, that would drive feet away from that huge system because people are consumers ultimately. If they think they can get the best deal, they're going to go for it. So how do you keep the system running? It's by not being transparent or honest, really, about what's going on. And the whole system seems to be, it's, it's I don't know, it's a structure that's based on graft. <laughs> well, it's funny about because crafting. the fees, you talk about transparency, Nobody even knows what these fees mean. They have this thing called charge master fees. And patients need to know that you don't have to pay what the charge master fee is. It reminds me of how when stuff goes on sale at the department stores, they hike up the price and then cut it 30%. So they're ending up making almost the same money. They had a lawsuit in out here in California with Safeway where they had the buy one, get one free, but they raised the price to where when you got the second free one, it was practically the same cost as if you bought two in the first place. And that's how these hospital fees are. They're squirrely. They aren't real. And anybody, I beg you that if you have to go to the hospital, ask to go to accounting and say, how much will this cost if I pay for it? And you'd be amazed at the price difference. I agree. I, I've told patients to do that. And they've gotten 70%, 80% discount by 
going in there and saying, look, this is what I'm going to give you. Will you accept it? And you'll, you're amazed that they'll take it. But it's about patients taking their power back. And it's about being a savvy consumer and having the utmost love for yourself, you know, not taking things because that's the way it is. And Dr. Singleton and I are here to tell you that it's not, that's not the only thing there is. There's a lot of ways to access the system, to work around the system, to go parallel to the system and get what you need. You know, Marilyn, our time goes way too quickly, but I want to make sure that people know how to listen to your podcast on Mondays and read your blogs. Well, okay. The show plays on Monday at americaoutloud.com forward slash pulse, just on any media player, but it goes direct to podcast the next day. So that means by that it's 5 p.m. Eastern, that by 5 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday, you can go to the website and then click on either at the website or if you have, you know, Apple, Spotify, whatever, any of these usual podcast things, you can listen to the podcast then. And it's, it's fun and educational, it has all sorts of medical topics. And we, just like Dr. George does, we just want people to be educated so you can make your own choices I don't want to choose for you. I'll choose things for you when it's something that I have the knowledge and experience that think this is what you need to do. But you have to trust me to believe me. And how do we get that trust? By being open and honest, admitting when we don't know something, and just being a human being. I couldn't have said it better. And that's what we all need to be is more human. On that note, let's, uh, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. It's always a pleasure. And I will hope that you want to come back in the future. Oh, any time, you know, we could do this for hours, but I know it's always, (laughs) we can't. (laughs) It's It's a pleasure. I love it. I can't wait to have you back. And of course, I will always want to be on your show whenever you want me to. Okay. It's a deal. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me and thank you everybody for living in the solution. Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Liberty Talk FM.